now, it's my pleasure to invite our speaker up, Sharon Solomon. I have been her friend for more than 40 years. She's one of our founding members and the wife of our founder, Paul Solomon. Sharon has done just about anything that let me reword that. I was going to say Sharon's done just about anything you've ever heard of that could be done here at the fellowship. Sharon has done almost any job <laughs> that uh, you could imagine that ever needed to happen here. And she's often been found behind the scenes. And also she lovingly works with the children, with Clarissa currently. And is on, she's on our pastoral council and she serves on our board of directors. And that's just a few things that she does. Then there's the other stuff, which you find out about as you get to know her or hear her words. And so with no further ado, we would love to invite Sharon Solomon up to share with us this morning. Okay, so today the theme is light, obviously, and we don't have any light from uh, the electric company. But we're going to talk about light, and we're going to talk about the, uh, the holiday of Hanukkah, the Jewish holiday, which begins on Tuesday evening. And Hanukkah is also called the Festival of Lights. Now, about 200 years before the birth of Christ, the uh, land of Israel was occupied by the Syrians. And King Akashverus was the king the Syrian ruler, and he wanted to change the people's worship to his beliefs with the idols and the gods and the goddesses of the Syrian pantheon. And the Jewish people were not very happy about that. So one day, um, he, him, his soldiers were asking or insisting that the Jewish people come up and worship the idols. And one man, Mattathias, got so angry, he went and he killed one of, the, one of his fellow Jews who had come up and worshipped in the holistic way. I mean, the Hellenistic way. <laughs> So um, he obviously had to leave because the king would be very angry. And he gathered together a group of Jewish people who didn't want to worship idols. And they went to the hills. And they fought this small band of Jews, fought this whole big Syrian army, and occupied Jerusalem. And they went to the temple, which had been ravaged, destroyed almost, by the Syrian army. They had gone through the temple and they had um, stolen the sacred scrolls and uh, brought pigs in and did everything they could to um, devastate the Jewish people and their mode of worship. And they cleaned up the temple, the Jewish, the small band of Jews that had conquered Jerusalem, they cleaned up the temple. And in the temple, even today, there's a place, in the, especially in Orthodox worship, it's called the everlasting light. And this light burns perpetually, except today, <laughs> You know, we have electricity. Now it's used by electricity. Now we can't do anything about it. But at that in ancient times, it was an oil lamp. And, um, and it took, um, they, when they were cleaning up the temple, they looked all over to find any oil that they could put in the burn in the everlasting light. And they found a little container, a little vial, that would only last for one day. And it took eight days to make a new batch. So the miracle of Hanukkah is that this little oil that they put in for the everlasting light that was only enough to last for one day, lasted for eight days. 
And therefore, every year we celebrate that miracle by burning the menorah, by lighting candles uh, in what we call the menorah. Now, the eight is very significant because seven in the, the seven in Jewish numerology means completion and perfection, but perfection in a worldly sense that you can achieve on earth. But the eight, which is the number of the Kabbalists, is one beyond the seven, and that means you have to bring in the mysticism of the higher realms, bring in the unseen world. And as I was meditating on the uh, theme this week of Hanukkah, I realized that with, as with so many other disciplines that go from religion to tradition and um, different rituals, uh, the seven terraces fits perfectly in with the burning of the menorah candle for eight days and the, um, so the seven terraces, we've often put on the Kabbalistic tree. We can use the seven terraces in talking. <laughs> oh, <that's it. laughs> okay, so we're bringing this light. So now, in all the temples around the world, the everlasting light is burning again. That's burning with electricity. <laughs> No, how we're powerful doing you one. were! Did you talking about the oh, light? We have to do. Can I? Can I hold it? Yeah, yeah. Sure. hold it. All Just right. hold it. You can move around. It's much yes, better. Yeah. All right. So, um, so the the seven terraces can be put on, as I said, the Kabbalistic tree, on the I Ching. Um, it can. You can use the seven terraces in talking about the gods and the goddesses of all the ancient Patna. Pantheons. And you can also use seven terraces for burning the Hanukkah candles. Now, the, if the Hanukkah candles, um, you see here, I'm going to do the blessing and say the prayer over them at the end of my um, talk, but this candle lights all the other candle, and that's called the shamus. And I can, can, can think of the shamas as bringing light from the separate reality into this reality. So in our seven terraces, which some of you experience every week with Sarah and Cynthia when they do the meditation, I'm going to tell you a little bit about each of those seven terraces. And if you like, and I'm going to do it, each day of Hanukkah, meditate on one of the seven terraces, and we will build each day uh, a new experience of growth and of light in, in our lives. So the, the shamus is the meadow. And in the meadow, we go to a separate reality where we meet God. And we go into the cause world. This is the result world. The physical reality is the result world. The cause world is the unseen world. And if we can build something in the unseen world, we can manifest it in this physical reality. That was, you heard a lot about that in the books The Secret. But that's um, a known um, teaching from ancient Judaism, ancient Christianity, what you build in the cause world, you manifest on the result world. And through the years, there have been so many examples of people building things in the cause world and um, manifesting on the result world. And I'm just thinking about it years ago, um, one of the women in the fellowship had wanted new clothes and didn't have any money. And so she went into her meadow and she started trying on clothes and thinking of all these things that she wanted. 
And suddenly, people all over Virginia Beach were bringing clothes to the fellowship in her size. <laughs> now, I, when I go into my meadow, I always have my, I had a pet lamb. And my, the lamb comes to my meadow every time. And, and I enjoy my meadow so much because he always talks to me. He says, that. <laughs> But my first experience in my meadow that really manifested for me is one day as I was in my meadow, I saw a little white rabbit coming, running past and saying, I'm late, I'm late, I'm late. You know that white rabbit? And I realized that I was resisting all my lessons and I was stalling in my spiritual growth and suddenly I just got it. You know, you, you have to participate in these things. Uh, you, you have to uh, join groups. You have to be a part of the group. And it was in the meadow, God can speak to you. And you can get messages. Then, from the meadow, we're going up to seven terraces. Um, so, on the red terrace, this is... I expect to be changed by this experience. And in this terrace, you think of the most exciting thing you can think of to get up your energy. What is the most wonderful experience you've ever had in your life? For some people, they use um, sports games. You know, they love sports. You go to the theater or go to one of these music concerts or play a musical instrument. Or just think of an experience that was so special to you that you could bring up this, I, I'm so excited. I know that God's presence is with me. For me, it was my wedding, the most exciting day in my life. If I want to bring up a feeling of joy and excitement, I think of my husband and my wedding. And I can just, you know, I just burst out with joy when I think of that, I expect to be changed by this experience. And you can be changed every time you go into meditation. And you can expect on the first day of these eight days of Hanukkah that you're going to be changed. Something's going to be happening in these eight days that's going to change your life. In the, after these eight days, you're not going to be the same person that you were before. And that happens because you go to the second garden and you go to this and this these these um, seven terraces happen in every effective meditation experience whether you're consciously aware of them or not on the second terrace is the terrace of forgiveness and of death so I forgive I forgive other people for things they've done for me, to me that I feel a bit offensive. And I forgive myself for being a victim of some experiences. Now, for me, I had an experience, just to give you an example, a few years back, that I became, I felt somebody did something a great wrong to me. And I just didn't want to forgive her. I was so angry, I wasn't going to, you know, that was just not possible. And then I had a vision that I came back married to her in the next life. <laughs> <laughs> and, I just, and I did everything I could <laughs> to forgive her. So if you ever don't want to forgive, and, and that was just, <laughs> now we say these terraces are real. And what, they're real, not necessarily because they exist in another realm, though they do. They're real because they have an effect on you. They change your life. So I forgave her. And um, we're not the best friends, but I can hug her and love her. And then I, when, and I leave off on the second terrace, I leave off my anger and my hurt and my pain and any negative emotion. And I, I feel as if it sinks into the soil. And what it does is it sinks into the soil. 
is it becomes compost. And compost, because everything is energy, all those negative emotions are just energy. If they become compost, then they can rise again and I go to the third garden, which is new life. And I am new, because I am. Now, I don't know what this new person is going to be the third day of my going through these um, eight days of Hanukkah. I don't know what this newness is going to be. But I can have skills I didn't have before. And for me, now it hasn't happened yet, but I'm still optimistic, even though I'm more than 70 years old, my new being is thin. <laughs> And that's really being optimistic. <laughs> but someday, <laughs> some way, I'm going to be thin. <laughs> and you think of your new you with the qualities that you might want to have and that you haven't been able to manifest yet. Now, this new being rises still higher. And we're on the fourth grade. Now, there's so much more to all these terraces. I'm doing it very briefly. but doing it even in this way, you can have an understanding of the eight days of Hanukkah and the potential there, and also of a little bit more about what you do in the meditation, what you can experience in the meditation that you have here before the Sunday service, which may encourage more of you to come 15 minutes earlier. Now, on the fourth garden, and each of them is a different color, the first terrace is red, the second terrace is orange, and it also corresponds to the chakras. Now we're going, the third terrace is yellow, and the fourth terrace is green. And on the green terrace is where I meet my master, the source of my being. And for many of us, that master is the Christ. But it also can be Mohammed, it could be the Buddha, it could be any great teacher, female or male. And we personify it because it's easier to speak to a personification than um, um, a nebulous force. But really, who you meet on the fourth terrace is that aspect of yourself, the higher part of you. And those masters, teachers that we meet there, the Christ, the Buddha, Lao Tzu, Mohammed, they are personification of who we can become when we are connected to source. And we, on that terrace, we can feel encompassed by the presence of the Christ and feel safe and secure and loved. You ever, you know, I, for me, I, you know, I've had a hard time this past year. A lot of things happened in my life that were difficult. And my goal, or my thing, is to remember. You know, I, I, you have a choice. I have a choice every day. Am I going to let all these things, these negative things that happened to me, rule my life? Am I a victim of them? Or am I encompassed by the source of my being? Is the presence with me? And sometimes I'll be going around just saying, you know, I hate everything. What is it? And I say, oh, wait a second, I have a choice. And then all of a sudden I feel loved and I feel that presence with me. And then when I feel that presence on the fifth day of the Hanukkah, I can rise still higher and I am on my blue garden. And this is where I walk with God and I have a running conversation with God. And that's very special for me. I go back to um, in the early days of the fellowship. A lot of times we used to take walks on the beach. And I feel like when I go to my blue garden, I'm, I, you know, I'm supposed to look, have flowers and trees. and It's a beautiful place, but mine is always the ocean, the whole expanse of the ocean. And I'm walking with my friends on the beach, and God is with us. And in that moment, I, the affirmation on the Blue Terrace is that I will be done. And I realize here that God always wants the best for me. There's absolutely no exception. 
And if I think that there's a difference between what I want for myself and what God wants for me, it's because I don't have the vision, the distant vision that God has. God always wants the best. And everything that happens to me is according to God's plan. Now, I might make mistakes, but God will remedy them. Everything is, everything is a lesson. I can learn from everything I experience. And again, it's a matter of which I have to remember that. If I can remember that, then I walk with my best friend, with God, every day of my life. And I rise still higher, and I go to the Violet Garden. The Violet Terrace is where, where I take responsibility for all I experience. And that is res the ability to respond. And my goal on that terrace is the ability to respond with love, with kindness, with strength, with confidence in every experience I have. I had an experience the other day where somebody asked me a question about a friend of mine, and I said something negative instead of something positive. And I said, oh my god, you know, I'm working for 40 years, and I didn't I mean, suddenly I did blah, 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 blah. instead of saying something really good and kind and wonderful. And I stewed about that for, for two days. The ability to respond, to be in the moment, to be in the present, to, um, to, to you know, not forget who I am, not to say something negative about somebody to get somebody else's support. Oh, you know, you're good and that one's bad. To remember that I have the ability to respond. And the other part of it is the, that terrace, the, the sixth terrace, is that I have whatever talent I am willing to take responsibility for, I can have. So if I'm willing to take responsibility for standing up here and speaking, then I can become a good speaker. I guess sometimes I do and sometimes I don't, even in the same talk. <laughs> but it's, it's gradual, it's step by step by step to be a healer. Now there are times when I've done things that were really healing for people, and other times I felt you know, very insecure and couldn't be a healer because I just didn't take responsibility for that. Healer, teacher, writer, anything I'm taking responsibility for, I can have that talent because God has given it to me. Now on top of that taking responsibility, there's the cloud of unknowing. And that cloud of unknowing can part if I take responsibility for my life. And I end up on the white garden. And you may remember that the affirmation there is limitless power, absolute harmony, eternal duration. And we did, you know, we've done exercises of doing a month on each of the terraces. And after going through uh, six months of a month of terrace, and I, and lessons after lesson after lesson on each of these gardens, I thought, oh, I'm on the white terrace. I'm on vacation, this is going to be wonderful. And suddenly, I go to my white terrace and my world falls apart. And I said, what in the world's going on here? And I realize that the white terrace is seeing the world through the eyes of God. And those things that we think are so important to us, those, tra quote, tragedies that we experience every day, really don't matter in, in the infiniteness of time. And so I have to look at my world through the eyes of God. And that's a challenge sometimes. But when you do, the world changes, and so do all the relationships in it. From that white garden, I go to my temple. And the temple is you. And we can tell a lot about you, about how you, how you construct the temple. And the temple is the beautiful place 
And this is where I meet God. All those steps in the meditation process are preparation for meditation. And it's in the temple that um, I can come into the silence and then really meditate and be beyond the mind, the eighth day of the Hanukkah candles. So these are the eight days of Hanukkah, bringing in the light into the world. And through all the different traditions, there's, this is the season for bringing the light into the world. These are the darkest days, but light comes from beyond. And, and soon, no matter how dark it is, the light is about to come back onto the earth. And in all of the traditions, in the esoteric teachings, who is the light? You are the light. Each of us. And it's up to us to spread that light around the world. And I see lights after light after light after light all around here, all you beautiful people. I feel that you are a blessing in my life. Um, I was going to light the Hanukkah candles. Do we have time to do that, or shall we? Yeah. Um, this, the the Hanukkah, can, Hanukkah candles are supposed to be, they're supposed to be lit in the windows or at the doorway, because this is an expression that, of light, bringing light out into the world. Baruch Ata Adonoi, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Kiddushanu Shel Hanukkah. Baruch Ata Adonoi, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Sha'asa Misim Lavosenu, Bayomim Hoheim Lazman Hazer. Baruch Ata Adonoi, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Shehekayanu vikiyumanu vihikiyanu lazman hazer. Blessed are thou, O oh Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by his commandments and commanded us to kindle the Hanukkah lights. Blessed are you, O oh Lord our God, King of the universe, who has granted us life, sustained us, and enabled us to reach this occasion. And the first blessing, the, the, uh, the third blessing, is um, only said the first night. And um, let's see, I skipped one. Blessed are you, are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who performed miracles for our forefathers in, from this day in this time. And you light a new, a second candle each night you add because you increase the light into the world, night by night. And by the eighth night, we enter the unseen world. Thank you.